Um, I just want to start before introducing um, Mia, who will tell you more about uh, the agenda for today. I just want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, Columbia University School of the Arts recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lene, Lenape and Wappinger people. By acknowledging legacies of displacement, migration, and settlement, we are taking a small first step toward the long and overdue process of healing and repair. The School of the Arts continues to confront and address issues of exclusion, erasure, and systematic discri discrimination through ongoing education and a commitment to equitable representation. So now I want to introduce Mia Masaoka, who will tell you a little bit more about our program and introduce our speakers for today. Hi, hi everybody here in person and also those of you Zooming. Um, we really want to welcome you. We're really excited about today. And um, just quickly, thank you so much, Julie. And Julie is the Dean of Finances. And at around the end, last 12 minutes or so of our one hour um, presentation, Julie will ask, will be answering any questions you might all have about finances for the program. And, um, and then I also have here Elena DeVito, who is a current student in the Sound Art program. And she'll be saying a few words, a few sentences about her work. And Brad Garten, who is our leading light in the program. And he, along with Douglas Repetta, founded, started the program. So we're thrilled to have him here. John and John Kessler, thank you. And Anthony Sertel Dean, who is a, an alumni of the program. And Seth Cluett, who is the uh, director of Computer Music Center and the assistant director of uh, the Sound Art program. So um, with that, let's go straight to the students. Um, Alana, can you say a few words about um, what you're working on now, what you're interested in? Okay, I didn't know you were going to start with me. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and I think after, later on, people can have questions for you, or actually not even now, too, if, they ha if people here want to have questions for a, a current student in the program. And also, um, the Zooms can can do chats yes. questions yes we can get zoom chats okay um, are you I monitoring the zoom chats or is, oh, who's um, kenny can monitor them and then text them to me okay so. perfect all right so my name is alana um my the name i usually go on my artwork and my writing is am devito my pronouns are they them they them not she <laughs> sorry <laughs> um anyway uh, I my work has a lot to do with spatial. I used to work in spatial audio a lot, but in a very DIY way, as opposed to using um, too many VSTs and stuff like that. Um, I use a lot of interaction, and uh, I basically use these technologies to explore and, or sorry, to give people a chance to explore different states of reality, like the inner self and the outer self, and the surreal world and the hyper-real world through their ears and through exploring and play. Um, it's a lot of issues of gender and identity, but also general societal dissociation with what's going on in the world and how we kind of deal both as a community and internally. And I try to do that through multi-sensory experiences, but led by sound. Um, and uh, the thing I'm, a couple of things I'm working on right now are um, I have um, a bunch of sensors on a bike, and when you ride it, it uh, it picks up the sounds of the the bike and then feeds it into a uh, neural network that I've trained on different. Uh, it's a voice, two different voice data sets, and I'm currently training it, training a new data set on my own voice, which will take a little while for. Um, uh, for me to gather all that 18 hours of me talking. So, um, yeah, so those are Wait, thank the you. most and recent Anthony, stuff. Our alum, and Anthony. Just one quick second. And you have uh, work today in the open studios that starts uh, in Prentice Hall later this afternoon. Yes, and I have a lot of little fun things to try as I come by. From two to five, so stay tuned. Right across the street. So, Anthony. An um, why don't you say a few words about what you've been working on and maybe experiences in the program, and then people can have a chance to ask both of the, both of the students questions. Yeah, great. Hi, I'm Anthony. Um, I was in the sound art program, graduated in 2022. Um, my work is 
wide spanning, all related to sound, as you might expect. Um, uh, this goes from theater and live performance to film and radio and installation work, um, uh, pulling from experimental performance uh, and oral history, um, really using sound as a means uh, for storytelling. Um, that said, a lot of the work I've been doing recently has been uh, sound designing and scoring films, which is also something I really enjoy doing. Um, there's something really exciting about uh, the sound art program where you can come in from a lot of different perspectives that can also then, uh, you can find where your sort of connection with sound as a medium is and then really sit with that, cook with that, and then try things out and <laughs> figure out, hey, this is working for me, this isn't working for me. Oh, this is something I'd be excited in exploring more. And there's not necessarily one path or course. I'm selling the program a lot more so than talking about my work. Yeah, uh, I do a bunch of different things. Radio's fun. Um, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. And maybe now is a good time to take some quick questions from um, if any of you have questions for the students. Yes. You mentioned oral histories, and I'm curious to know if you had an experience in the program taking archival classes or research-based classes like that. Yeah, um, there is an oral history master program at Columbia where I was able to sort of sit in on, I was able to take a course through the oral history master's program um, and work with some of the professors in that department during my time here. That was a really great opportunity and then also connected with other oral history students. Um, and now I'm working on this big uh, digital archiving oral history project with some folks who were in that program there. And you even had a oral history person on your thesis committee, if I That's remember correctly. That's true, Mr. Chow, wonderful person. <laughs> yeah, a question here? Hi, a uh, question for both of you. I'm just kind of curious as to how you kind of came to sound art as like a, a locus for your practices and, you know, um, like how long you had been developing that practice before you came to the program. Sure, yeah, so I'm a uh, been a musician for 15, 20 years, something like that now. Uh, and after touring for many, many years, um, I wanted to go back to school and I found out about this program called Electroacoustic Studies at Concordia in Montreal, which was a great bridge between kind of music and then this electroacoustic or avant-garde or experimental electronic you can kind of call it's all, like, all under the same umbrella slash like noise music. So that kind of got me into this world of, of um, sound in a very extended way. It's outside of what we think of as sound and music in mainstream and how we use technology to explore and um, expand our understanding of what sound can be and how it moves around us and how important it is and all this kind of stuff. So I got very deep into that and I started also doing sound design and score for films, which I still do a lot of as well. Um, and then, but it was a great avenue to be able to get more creative with sound work. And then I had people, uh, visual artists who asked me to collaborate for large scale installations um, because they liked my work. And then, so I started doing like eight channel surround sound installations for these big um, interdisciplinary works with textiles and videos and performers. And I still do, I still work with uh, a couple of different groups in Montreal and one main one that I still work with. And then from there, I heard about this program and I decided I might as well lean into the whole gallery art world and learn what that's all about because my background is predominantly music. So that's how I got here. Yeah, I also came in from, from a music place, but not everyone comes in from a music place. <laughs> um, sort of. Uh, me, me is the sort of, yeah, grew up like, you know, post-punk band, high school, great, love that. And then that just, I found sound as a way of expression that felt really right to me. 
um, then I was in really rooted in like downtown theater in New York for a while. And I'm a very collaborative artist working in sound design in that space, but there were a lot of sort of messy, toxic sort of environments I was in that was just not supporting the art that I was, I was feeling not represented in the art that I was making. And I needed a sort of shift and a refocus to sort of how I was working with sound. And I think that this program really helped redefine and refine uh, my artistic practices in that way. Um, it's how I came in and is definitely in talking about also collaborators, like being within a visual arts department, I also found new collaborators to work with, um, which I think is like finding people to work with is essential to living as an artist rather than uh, just making art. Yeah, just one quick uh, addition to that about people, like where people come to us from. Uh, our current incoming class has uh, two students who came with BFAs in visual arts, one in video and the other in new media. The third person is uh, here from a physics undergraduate. Uh, last year, we had a student in from an undergraduate at University of Rochester in Black Africana Studies. Another person came from, an, uh, in Alana's class, came from uh, BFA in painting in Ireland. So we it's across the board, there's no uh, like exact one way that people uh, come to us. It come, we accept all comers uh, with an interest in sound, so. Before we move on to um, the history of the program, uh, are there, is there any questions that uh, from the chat that we can? Um, I haven't gotten any questions from the chat okay. yet. I can give just a little bit of basic information, which this Great. may be a good time to do that and, and maybe it'll trigger some questions. Um, I just wanna make sure that you have uh, the most important dates, which is the application due date, uh, which is January 17th. That is a hard deadline. Um, it's 11.59 p.m. Eastern time, and you'll see the application actually shuts down after that. So please uh, make sure you get your application in on time. Um, we also have um, financial aid applications. Uh, if you're a domestic student, it's the FAFSA and uh, what we have, uh, the School of the Arts has its own financial aid application, which is also available via the application portal. Um, if you're an international student, you only have to do the School of the Arts um, application because the FAFSA unfortunately does not apply to you. Um, the deadline for that is um, February 1st, um, and anyone who is interested in submitting in uh, being considered for scholarship support must submit those applications. So all of this information we will send to you um, online. So I don't you don't have to worry about those dates, but um, please make sure that you get those those applications in on time. Um, and, in, and important to know the application process is need blind. So please do not be concerned that if you submit a financial aid application, it'll decrease your chances for being accepted. It's a completely separate process. So do not worry about that. Um, the committee, the faculty committee who will be reviewing your applications will not be seeing the financial aid applications. So that's just our office. Um, and then just one other date I wanted to make sure you guys have on your calendar. We're gonna do a general financial aid information session about financial aid at the School of the Arts in general. Um, and that is gonna be on December 7th at 7 p.m. So again, we have all of your information. Now that you're here, we'll send you information. Those of you on Zoom as well, we will send you information about that. Um, but if you wanna you know, kind of reserve that time, uh, December 7th at 7 p.m. Um, and that's all I have right now. Just, oh, just one more thing. Um, after this session, we have a session upstairs on the eighth floor for our visual arts program. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the two programs in terms of interest. So um, you are more than welcome to come up to the eighth floor and listen to that as well. There's some food up there. Unfortunately, we're not allowed food in this room, but we are allowed food upstairs. Um, so even if you don't wanna stay, but you wanna grab some coffee and a sandwich, feel free uh, after this to come up to the eighth floor. And then the open studios is gonna be across the street in Prentice Hall um, from two to 5 p.m. You'll see the work of the current sound artist um, and the visual artist as well. So. Great, thank you, Julie. Um, so I think uh, just a reminder that, uh, that in, when when, pe when um, people are in enrolled in the program of sound art, that there's a possibility of be of enrolling in the programs uh, in the classes at Barnard College as well, and as a research institute, all of the classes at Columbia University. Um, and we are the only sound art program in the New York City and also one of the very few sound art programs that is affiliated and a part of a research university, which is which is a huge um, benefit to the educational process. And um, Brad, can you say a few moments, a few words about the history of the program? 
Yeah, that's my job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Emeritus. Yeah. Um, you're hearing how broad this sound art program is in terms of who we attract and the kind of work that we try to promote. Um, that's actually one of the foundational principles, I think, of the program. And that's why it's that way. Um, to tell you what happened, back in the early 2000s, um, uh, I, we were noticing, first of all, I need to tell you a little bit kind of weird. The music department at Columbia is not part of the School of the Arts. Some of you know that, okay? That's because the music department predates the School of the Arts by about 100 years. So yeah, Columbia's old like me. Um, but um, as a result, there was this weird split between people doing art and people doing music, which is kind of odd. Um, but in the early 2000s, a lot of my colleagues in the music department, I'm a professor in the music faculty, were noticing that a lot of our applicants were doing things that weren't the traditional graduate music program stuff. Like they weren't writing string quartets. They were doing things like putting string quartets underwater. And you know, <laughs> actually, I'm not making that up. <laughs> so, um, so we noticed that these were very interesting students doing really interesting work but they didn't quite fit the model of what we had in the music department. In the meantime, over on the School of the Arts side, my, my good friend and colleague, John Kessler, they were noticing the same thing for people applying to visual arts, that they had sound as a kind of a primary constituent of their, of their work, not visual arts, painting or whatever. So he and I got together and with the encouragement and great support of all of our colleagues, both in the School of the Arts and in the music department, um, we crafted a proposal that we had to submit to New York State and uh, got it approved for the Sound Art MFA. And that's where we are today. Um, the cool thing about this is that you are actually part of two departments at Columbia. Well, School of the Arts is more than a department. It's like a huge thing. Um, but the music is a, is a department. And the Sound Art program is a bridge between the two. And that bridge happens primarily because of the Computer Music Center. That's where that's kind of the sponsor of all the work and that kind of kind of works with the way that we are configuring the program as being broadly based because at the computer music Center, we have always supported a wide range of work because technology is kind of work blind, you can use it, however you want and um yeah so Seth is now the director of that program or of the of the Center. And, uh, yeah he'll say more about it later. Thanks. Mia, I have a question from Zoom for you. Okay. Um, are some of the explorations in sound with 3D painting? And do some of the sound explorations use songs and or film? Let me answer the, let me answer the 3D painting thing. Um, not maybe 3D painting, but all of my work lately, I've been completely captured by um, VR. You know, here I am the music professor, right? But it makes me feel like a kid again. You know, I get a fire up unity and then I get to play God. I want a volcano over there and I want it to have blue lava, you know? <laughs> so we definitely support that sort of work. Um, also, as Alana was mentioning, we support a lot of, you know, tangible, spatialized audio. That's a big part of what we're doing at the CMC these days too. Um, yeah, maybe we'll hold on that question for about song. It's kind of a Oh yeah, we do big... songs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, the, uh, thank you, Brad, um, the curriculum of the program and there's a, uh, and the exhibition possibilities. And today, uh, for example, Alana is going to be showing their work and from two to five open studios. And it's where all the studios in Prentice, it's six floors building open their studios and um, the public is welcome. We invite curators, we invite um, you know, the, the public at large, and there's uh, hundreds of people who can come in, see your work in progress, and um, the, the uh, students often have a card, and they can be contacted by the curators, and we've actually had an amazing success with um, curators coming in and having interest, or other people, other artists wanted to collaborate because they see an artist whose work they think is interesting. And it's a really uh, interesting way of making connections to the community here at, in New York City. Um, and uh, the, New York City is an incredible location intellectually and artistically. Um, for example, there's relationships with some of the galleries. This, um, we were able to bring in, we have a a visiting artist program and we were able to work with Martha Joseph who's a curator of music and sound at MoMA and she um, working with her, we were able to bring uh, 
organized a workshop by Suzanne Ciani and Sarah, and they also did studio visits. Um, Suzanne did studio visits with, with each of the sound art students. And so um, having this proximity to these kinds, uh, this, this really, this rich community in the arts is also this amazing built in part of being this program in New York City. Um, so the program, the part of the program that is required is there's a critical issues class and the current um, professor for that is James Hoff and they introduce um, different current contemporary artists, the practice and theory of, of what's going on now. There's also a seminar in related issues and a grad studio class, which is more like a lab where we bring in artists um, and they do an artist talk for the six students and then do individual individual uh, meetings with each student. And it's a way to begin to build up um, a way to talk critically about your own work, to articulate your ideas to somebody else, to get that kind of feedback, that critical feedback that's so hard to get if you're outside of a program, and bringing in theorists, bringing in curators, bringing in artists of different levels of their career is it, it's, an, it's an incredible experience. We also have a mentor week, which happens one week each semester where uh, we bring in a mentor um, this, this semester. It was Lovid and it's, it's, it was a team. Um, and they, they do, they're real pioneers in digital, digital, uh, digital work. And they have work that's, um, the students were able to go to galleries with and really have a kind of day-to-day -day experience with a mentor where you can have one conversation that continues the next day in somewhat, of the old school style of when artists, you know, worked with an, an older artist and maybe did their floors and did all the things as an apprentice would. And it's this older kind of relationship that's outside of the classroom, outside of the ivory tower. And it's a really different kind of conversation and bond that can happen during mentor week. Um, um, we do have the studios and later Seth will be talking about um, the facilities, including the recording room and the studios that, and we share the, um, the spaces with the Computer Music Center. So there's a real cross um, blending and pollination that can happen with students in the Computer Music Center program. And it's a really rich way. There's lots of collaborations that occur just from running into people at the hallway, taking classes together, et cetera. Um, I think, oh, and for the exhibitions, there's the first year show, of, um, and which is at Lenfest, and also the thesis show, which is a state of the art um, gallery space here at Lenfest. And also, we often program um, a library show, which is an opportunity for students to get some public face work right out the door and when they arrive after a couple of months. And also we've done collaborations with the, um, the Computer Music Center at Issue Project Room, at Pioneer Works, and at some of the, um, some of the spaces locally. So it's, um, um, let's see, I think, should we go on to this, talk about the studios? What, what do you say? Okay. Um, yeah, so. And the uh, electives. Yeah, and the electives. So, um, so. I don't know. I'll, I'll be confessional here and say that I really wish that this program had existed when I was going through school. I did an MFA in sculpture and then taught photography for three years and then ended up going back and getting a doctorate in music. And now I'm splitting my life between both places and I've never felt so at home. So it's a it's a uh, it's a really heartening place when you uh, don't want to lock yourself to one side or the other of practice and you can live in the kind of interstitial space. Um, so the electives are broad and wide ranging um, and we've said the word research a couple times and people have talked about computer programming languages and all, and all of this stuff. One thing that's important to know is that we don't expect any technical fluency from you except for a sort of uh, exposure to and fluency with sound software, DAW style, things like Logic or Ableton, something to work with sound, a basic understanding of sound, but not necessarily like super computational fluency like and you know people will will get into as much of that as they're interested in uh, there are some people who go through the program and concentrate on taking ceramics classes and sculpture and maybe we'll do a little bit of electronics here and there and then there's other people who will develop uh, Arduino interfaces to Macs to do interactive video and whatever 
I should say, though, that we are uh, the one commonality and the one thing that attracted me to the Computer Music Center is that it is never technology first. It is always creativity first. So you have an idea, the idea uh, creates a need, and then there is a community of people who generate the, the sort of knowledge base that provide you with the technology you need in order to realize your idea to the fullest. And that's the case across the doctoral composers as it is with the masters and sound art students there's not a kind of like we're a technology center and sometimes we make art it's like we are a community of creative practitioners and we use technology when it's efficacious we use duct tape and rubber bands when it's uh, appropriate uh, and so no holds barred in terms of the there's no dogma in terms of technology um so the electives are things like uh, uh brad teaches a two course sequence but for the next couple of years it'll be a one course sequence in the fall uh, um, called Sound Advanced Topics. Uh, don't be afraid by the word advanced. It tends to just be a topics-based thing that uh, that alternates years between uh, net-based web audio uh, uh, work and uh, VR-based work. And then every now and again, uh, an algorithmic composition uh, focus. And this year, I believe it's AI. Is that right, Brad? Yes, we did some AI. We Basically, it's an insane class because we try to cover like everything, <laughs> but it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, my main course that interfaces with the Sounder program is a class called Sound Foundations. Uh, this is a, um, a bit of a, a misnomer of a name. It's a, a sort of 100% humanities facing critical sound studies uh, uh, course with sort of uncompromising technology associated with it. So my doctorate, uh, I did a, a media uh, studies doctorate. So um, the, like the sound, I did a sound practitioners thing, but I wrote a paper that was basically media studies. And so I think a lot about like, what is the role of uh, sound technology and power structures in society. And so there are very few places where you can uh, learn the sound studies side and learn the technology uh, uh, that influences in a way that you can be fluent about both sides of it and really understand like what's at work in, in, in society. So we do, it's all creative project based work. So it's like, instead of writing an essay about sound studies, we make a radio play or we make a sculpture, or we make a thing. So um, then there are courses in uh, data visualization and sonification. There are, there's a recorded sound class that's very popular for people who are wanting to get more into uh, recording technology. Um, we offer a course called uh, Music, Math, and Mind, uh, taught by David Selzer, who's one of our uh, faculty members in the uh, CUIMC, the Columbia University Medical Center. Um, David is also David Soldier of the Soldier String Quartet that did work with like DJ Spooky and uh, John Zorn and a bunch of people in the in the 80s. Um, uh, also, the Thai Elephant Orchestra, if you've never seen it, go on YouTube. It's a real treat. Um, uh, that course uh, is amazing because he ha he basically knows everyone in the world who does experimental things and he has a constant cast of characters coming in as a guest lecturer. So this year was Phil Niblock and um, uh, uh, Pedro uh, Ortiz, Cortez. or Cortez, the uh, flamenco guitar player. Um, uh, it, it goes the gambit. Um, Elizabeth oh, Elizabeth Olson, who's like one of the world's foremost uh, auditory physiologists. So everybody got to ask their ear questions and that. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's the curriculum. And you have uh, the flexibility to work within the CMC curriculum, but you can also take courses across the campus. So uh, classes like um, um, Elizabeth Alonzo's uh, uh, Sound in the Muslim World or uh, uh, John Pemberton's uh, Anthropology of Sound class, or there's a class in the religion, in the religion department on sound and death. There's a, there's a bunch of or silence and death, I think is the name of that class. Did you, did you take it? I can't remember. Um, so yeah, so the campus is, 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 is riddled with opportunities to take courses that reinforce your, your work. So um, with that, I'm going to switch over. Uh, Actually, before Seth leaves, uh, don't forget also music department and uh, visual arts, you know, all those classes. You can take George Lewis's interactive you know, music class, or you can take John's, John Kessler's sculpture class. No, obviously. Yeah, I would say half of our students at the moment are in uh, in George's decolonizing music class, and then the other half is in Jack Halberstam's uh, uh, gender studies class. So it's a it's a real uh, gamut. Yeah, please. Are you able to go into detail on what sorts of facilities are available for the program, and also how research funding is? Um, I don't want to use the word propagated, but that feels like. Of course. <laughs> um, that was a perfect segue. 
Uh, I'll draw your attention to the screen behind me. Um, so uh, what you're looking at is a picture of the RCA Mark II synthesizer. But the Computer Music Center, um, if you've read you know, history books, is- It's my office right yeah, now. Yeah, it's also <laughs> Mia's office. Um, it's the, we're the oldest electronic and computer music research facility at a university in the world. Um, uh, there are some at radio stations and things like that a couple years earlier than us, but in terms of universities, we're the oldest. Uh, and we occupy the same 6,000 square feet as the original Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center. Um, so those RCA records with Milton Babbitt and uh, Pearl Smiley and Alice Shields and uh, uh, Vladimir Ushashevsky, Otto Luning, those folks, uh, were all created in the spaces where, which now house our sound art studios and electronic music studios uh, in the Computer Music Center. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we are in glorious Prentice Hall. It's a 1909 dairy factory, so you don't feel bad dropping paint on the floor. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, next slide, please. The Computer Music Center is all of the things in orange. Um, we have a uh, uh, main seminar room, uh, a, an electronic music studio, a recording studio, a spatial audio research suite, uh, um, a workshop space uh, for the sound art students alone that is just for like dirty work uh, saws and drills and things like that. Uh, and then three first year studios for the sound art first years and then three uh, larger studios for the sound art second year. So the first year studios are those 314 A, B, C, and then that workspace is a shared space for the three in the small studios. Then the uh, second year studios are the 320 uh, A, B, and F over there. Um, so between 250 and 300 square feet for those spaces. Um, so um, uh, next slide, please. So this is the RCA Mark II synthesizer. It's a behemoth. It's the first, the world's first programmable music synthesizer. I was made while Bob Moog was still an undergraduate in the electrical engineering program here and installed by his advisor. It's kind of a neat thing. First piece of uh, electronic music to win the Pulitzer Prize by Charles Wern and was composed on it in our facility. So moving on, next slide. This is how the studio uh, looked when Brad got there. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this, 35 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, but one of the things that I love about this, and I show it in the slideshow, is because um, uh, uh, sound producing at the center has always been about ears and hands. Like, how do you uh, how do you uh, get to the sound that you have in your mind, and what tools can you use to get there? And it's kind of a by any means necessary approach, and we really do mean that. It's like computers are good, microcontrollers are good, but so are synthesizers and hacked circuits and broken cassette decks and all of the things that happen. Next slide, please. That is this space. Uh, now it's a it's it, uh, changed just a little bit. Uh, we didn't realize that people would be on Zoom so much. So instead of going across the street, we're doing this. So I have uh, there's been some developments in here, including an ARP 2600, which is in the place of the Moog uh, System 35 over there. Um, we have a lot of historical synthesizers. The Buchla on the left hand side is the second Buchla after the San Francisco Tape Music Center, Pauline Oliveros and Roman Sender. Um, to the right of the computer is a Surge 1979 Surge two panels and then a Moog System 35. Um, we are super interested in um, in uh, the sort of continuum between analog and digital. So, uh, like I said, with no holds barred, like not uh, dogmatic about anything. Um, all of the wiring in the whole facility, you don't need to know what this means, but is like DC coupled and shielded, which basically means that. Audio or digital can go between any room and from any piece of technology to any piece of technology. And there's no boundary basically between using a computer to control a piece of electronics or using electronics to control something else or sending audio between two places and never knowing electronics are involved. Um, so it's, it's fairly um, uh, uh, open that way. Uh, all of the rooms are connected to each other via audio over ethernet. But since it's shielded, it could also be straight audio between the rooms. And we have four channels of 6G SDI video between the rooms so that you can set up bi-directional video in the room so you can make the whole facility an installation. And um, if, if you don't know what that means, don't worry. I don't know what most of this is either. So <laughs> It's really cool, and it's meant to be transparent and, uh, and uh, flexible. Uh, we have a, a research thread around uh, accessible technical space design. So we're thinking a lot about what makes people who've been traditionally marginalized out of technical spaces feel like they belong in the space. And so you should be able to do everything you want to do within the first five minutes of walking in the studio, so long as someone else hasn't Yeah, changed. I should also point out the piano is a Yamaha disc clavier, so it's also... Yeah. Cool. Uh, next slide. Uh, actually, before you leave that, she had a question about the research Oh, yeah, funding. please. Yeah. 
But uh, her second part was the research. I funding. also want to be aware of time oh, yeah. because we want to make sure there's questions for Julie and research. So if okay. we could. I'll, uh, two min two minutes you. and I'm done. Uh, next slide. Ooh, next slide. Next slide. There we go. Other side of the room. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, weird. Oh, these are uh, these uh, are we did a project where we did augmented reality overlays on all the technology so you could see what the name of everything was on your phone. It was kind of cool. Go next slide. Uh, so we have a seminar room, uh, fancy speaker system, a um, uh, bunch of synthesizers. <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so um, this room is geared around pedagogical clarity. So all of the devices in there have the normal labels with the normal names so that if you're trying to learn a thing, you can learn the archetypal version of it instead of some fancy thing with a with a name that's uh, uh, sort of unknowable. So an MPC and a TR-808 and a TB-303 because those things are like iconic in the history of music. Um, moving on. Uh, there's a recording studio. It never has the fluorescent lights on. It's always like a lamp and it's very uh, dark and cozy and comfortable. Um, uh, but the uh, facility uh, is very easy to use. Plug a mic in, it shows up on the same channel and the dots like walk in, record one button. Um, next slide. Uh, we, uh, it has a headphone monitoring system and a couple of uh, uh, booths. Next slide. Uh, we have an EMT plate reverb. That's cool if you know what it is. If you don't, it's also cool. Uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, we have a, a electronics workbench facility and digital fabrication stuff. So we provide uh, our students uh, with all of the components for free uh, up to expensive things like big servos and solenoids and the actual boards like Arduino boards. We have examples of them so you can prototype things and not spend money. And then, uh, but this is a way to, for you to try things w before you buy three things that are wrong instead of uh, going down the path. Uh, moving on. Uh, yeah, so a cricket machine, uh, a nice 3D printer, uh, and a photo by Lovid up in the top. Next slide. Workshop space for the sound art students, lots of tools. Next slide. Uh, the floor is never this clean, but uh, next slide. Uh, this is it from the other side. Lots of uh, sun and light. All of our windows are acoustically isolated from the outside world. Next slide. Uh, and then we're doing a lot of spatial audio things. So this is a first order ambisonic cube, if you know what that is. If you don't, it's like being inside of sound. Uh, and uh, we have templates and technologies that you can just drop audio files in and experience that without knowing anything at all about how to program it. Um, next slide. And we made this uh, matrix array. This is something I designed that uh, um, uh, has an acoustically transparent screen in front of it, so you can play sound directly behind the screen. OK, I think that does it. Oh, um, research funding. So uh, the so research is a funny thing between both the doctoral program in music and the sound art MFA program. We regularly do grant-based research, but it's not our primary thing. So we'll often get a grant and then it'll bring in like a CS major, an E major, and one of the sound art students um, uh, or one of the doctoral students in music. And so it's a way to augment. Um, uh, if you're interested in that thread, there are lots of opportunities for participating in that sort of thing. So if you come from a place or want to go to a place where sound technology research in some way, neuroscience is a, is a part of your portfolio coming out of our thing, uh, we have tons of examples of people who uh, went that path. Um, and just to add that after this, um, Seth will be bringing, if, if you're welcome to look, have a tour of the facilities in person. So that'll be directly after this. And um, uh, just another thing to, that I think is important is that in the admissions process, um, potential students come in through sound, through the discipline of sound as part of their pr practice. But once students are admitted into the program and are taking sculpture courses or film classes, um, um, you know, painting, et cetera, there's a real freedom for your practice to grow, to expand, to have an emphasis in ceramics, to really become interdisciplinary with other students. So it's, um, you know, while it's a sound program, you have room to grow, you have room to change, your practice can expand. So don't feel any worry about that. Um, it looks like you have a question. Regarding that, are you Sorry, regarding that, uh, are you able to apply to multiple uh, arts departments like the sound art program as well as the sculpture or printmaking yes, department? yes, you can apply to multiple ones. But what often happens in that process 
is one of the, um, say the sculpture will say, this person sounds more, this person got rejected from our program, but it seems like they're more of a sound program. And so, but it's important to also to present your portfolio to each department individually and to apply individually if you think that we have had students who have gotten into more than one program and if that's the case then you get to choose of course which one you prefer but you have to like us best <laughs> <laughs> um, i have two questions from zoom um, the first is does the program cover field recordings for film documentary or live music recordings we have is it, the technology. Is it elective class. Yeah, we've got a lot of equipment you can check out too. Yeah, so um, one interesting thing in the program, we often have people who do sound design who come into the program and then they do sound design when they leave the program. But while they're here, they're tending to do gallery facing, art world facing work. And that, and, and that, is, it, that has made them very successful on the sound design side uh, because they're creative, they think outside the box, their ears are really well attuned, they're thinking about what sound means and when that's associated with picture, that you know, uh, goes out there, but I'm actively involved in field recording. Mia also does a lot of field recording. Brad does some field recording. We have hydrophones and shotgun mics and field recorders and, you know, all sorts of the technology necessary to do that. Uh, there are courses in that in other departments that people often take. Um, Alana's taking a class in sound design. Sound theater. design for theater, yeah, uh, at Bar Barnard. Barnard. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and one more question from Zoom. Are there, is there recommended reading, any particular software that's recommended to know before coming into the program? I no. would say no, <laughs> but definitely a fluency and an ability to work digitally and to use sound files to have some, some experience with sound. Um, I think sometimes there is a t sometimes there's applicants and they want to do sound work than they never have before and that's a bit problematic because the portfolio portion of the application is very important. Um, you know we want uh, it's a very it's a competitive program we only admit um, three three students a year. And we really like to look at um, what, what the work that they've been doing and as opposed to the work that they want to be doing in the future. So it's what, you know, the portfolio of what you have is, you know, and that it's it's um, indicative of some aspect or orientation towards sound, not so much music with diatonic scales, et cetera, but more of an, org an organic thinking and a, a, a approach to what what is this material of sound, because that's the focus of how we think and how we um, we work with this material of sound. Yeah, another question that often comes up uh, that I'll preempt is that like uh, the application process is not in is not like you're already great at this, so come to us. Uh, and it's not you know nothing about this, so we'll train you. It's like you have found us because you're in a trajectory and sound is a part of that and you have a fluency in one area and that may be sound but you may have a fluency in video and we catch you on the path and we're a momentum so i find it's useful to think about where is your work headed and so like if you have a spectacular installation in your portfolio that has no sound in it you should put in your strongest work but you should also let us know like where your stuff is headed in the direction of sound so we understand you know what your path is and how we might be helpful uh in the yeah or vice versa we get a lot of people who have primarily music-based applications but they're heading towards sound art you know that's important for us to see where are you going because you're going to be with us and go there hopefully exactly and again it's um it's not just us who are on the panel of admissions there's other faculty involved as well Are there any questions about admissions and financial aid before I head on upstairs to start the visual arts session? Um, just a reminder, we do have that financial aid info session, so uh, that'll be on December 12th. We will send you information about that, so any financial aid questions you can pose then. Um, so I'm going to run upstairs, um, but please feel free to join us afterwards or um, go on the tour and then join us, um, grab some food and whatever. Thank you I'll so mention, much. Yeah, while, while Julie's going, I'll mention you can go. Oh, okay. <laughs> See ya. Thank you, Julie. Um, uh, don't, don't be too freaked out. Universities are really slow, and it will take us a while to get through the application process. So, you know, even though the deadline is January 17th, don't be expecting to hear anything by the end of January. Don't be expecting to hear anything by the end of February. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just, it just takes a very long time to get all this. Right, exactly. Question, Question. over here. Yeah. 
With respect to our portfolios, um, how much, to what extent are you looking towards the like gallery applicability of the work that we submit? It's not so much of um, like a product to be put out on display and kind of a very market driven um, exhibitionist, somewhat crude way. It's really a, a very different kind of creative impulse that's important. A really, you know, um, a much deeper, much more deeply rooted sense of, of what is important. What do you value? How, what do you care about? Um, what's your relationship to the world? And, and so it's, it's a lot of things. Um, there's also, you know, it's not just gallery, there's also different kinds of street performances that are possible. There's a whole rich history of different kinds of public facing events. It could be online, for example, it could be entirely in digital domain and not it could it could be um, in some kind of very ethereal uh, situation. It could be in a more you know market driven um, endeavor as well. So it's really about the potential as well as what have they done so far. So I think it's always a balance. You know, you don't want someone who has done something, but then they have great goals to do something in the future, but haven't don't have much to show so far. And that might be really great for a, maybe another program, but we really like to see some of the work already in place. So, you know, but I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Anthony has a... Yeah. I, I can just say quantitatively, I remember in my application, I there was only, out of the entire application, there was only one project that was only like pseudo gallery facing. The rest was all other things. Right. I, I would say also um, that's a reflection of what it means to be a sound artist. Like other artists, I think, you know, for the majority, you do work towards the gallery and the traditions of the gallery. Um, that's definitely an interesting challenge as a sound artist that I like to deal with sometimes and I do like the presentation of that but as a sound artist that means we have an interesting wider array, array of skills and and sound can really be experienced in such a it's more accessible for a lot of people in a lot of ways which also means that it does remove it, it has a great um, presence outside of institutions so I think a little bit of both is exactly what it's like being a sound artist so I think that's probably nice to show that totally. you're you know that that's where you live is you know I, I i think i had some scores and sound design uh for for films i had some compositions that were just just sound pieces and then i had two installations that i'd done at galleries so it's definitely wide range that's super helpful you thank know, you one, one thing that occurs to me and this is for everybody i guess is that we're we're really looking for how you've taken advantage of the opportunities presented to you at different stages of your life. And that that kind of manifests in the sound art program. I think it was the second or third year for the for the thesis, the MFA thesis show. We didn't have the Lenfest Center here at the time. We actually took over a farm in upstate New York and basically made that the place where you know people could envision what am I gonna do there? You know, we had this great piece in a silo and another piece like with chickens or something. <laughs> yeah, and there's a chickens, lot of yeah. there's a lot of public practice work. I mean, uh, uh, this December, if you're in New York City, uh, one of our alums, Chargeray, has a, her first oh, yeah. has their first solo exhibition at Artist Space. But they often do things like setting up a table on the street and engaging people in these hand built built instruments that are uh, built synthesizers built into uh, uh, sort of critical black texts. So, like the 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 work can exist a lot of places and when we say gallery fit i think what we're saying really is like what kind of questions is your work asking and uh and how are you answering them in the process of making things um and uh yeah go ahead just a quick question could you could you repeat that artist's name uh char c-h-a-r and then the last name is jure j-e-r-e -E, with a accent igu uh, and it's artist space uh, curated by daniel jackson yeah Really excited about really that. Really excited. Yeah, that's so awesome. Really excited about that. A oh, question? <laughs> I'm excited about it too. <laughs> is it um is it portfolio fair game to present 
curations that we've done of other artists' work mm. that carried some sign shows? No. <laughs> Curation can be listed on your work of on your CV or on your resume, but it is not your not it's not a, we're not a curation program. There is a what there is a master's in curation program at Columbia, and it's a one year program. Yeah. And that can enrich your practice in general, but it's not your work necessarily unless you were are showing yourself to be a curator and a lot of us are curators a lot of us have done curation it's important part of the practice but the portfolio is really narrowly structured you know there's not a, a whole lot of time to see 10 works for example maybe and so you really want to focus on your most important work that you want the committee to focus on i i will say the there's a writing component to the application and if your curation plays a role in the way in in how you got to where you are now and then how you were thinking about going someplace else let us know that story of course like we're not yeah. saying throw away your curatorial work it's just saying like the portfolio is a place to show your work and then tell us how that played a role in your practice in the writing yeah we love different kinds of work and one thing about the sound program i think that's quite different from the other disciplines is routinely work is extremely diverse you know people are really doing different kinds of forms the form different forms and that doesn't happen so much in say painting and and so it's um it's a it's very wide ranging the spectrum is huge it's broad it's really about the work it's not about the form Um, I have a question for the students um, about mentorship and your experience having mentors and if you felt like when you came into the program, um, you felt like you had people to ask questions with and explore your ideas with. Um, that's my first question. Oh, I can I can say that I tech I still tech Seth. Uh, a bunch. Seth is all knowing. That's why. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, that was something that I was also explicitly looking for in going to grad school was for that sort of uh, foundation and support in that way. Um, and there, there's something to be said also about um, being in a larger sort of department in School of the Arts where you can also find mentorship necessarily, not necessarily just the people up here. And then there's also the mentor weeks. Um, when uh, if the mentor is invested, like that's a great relationship to build there. So the two to one student faculty ratio is pretty yeah. helpful. I I will say that it's been really wonderful in terms of having different professors that are very different, both in their own practices, but also temperament wise. And I mean that in the best way, because sometimes you want someone to come in and be like, this is all great, but technically this could improve or someone's gonna walk in and be like, I know move this here like the visually this doesn't work um you know like there's you you need both sides like sometimes you do want if someone to walk in just be like good job <laughs> like, you're doing great don't worry but other times you do want you know but, and i do find that with this program um and also the mentor weeks for me the best thing especially with james when we did ours last year first semester was to see that this kind of niche you know, in, outside of New York City, and maybe I'm from Montreal, and it's there's a lot of experimental media art and sound art there. Um, but it, it is kind of niche, and it's hard to find like the right place for it. But being in New York was like, wow, there's so many places to show that people are excited about this kind of more unusual, I guess, uh, niche art form. Um, so you're definitely in the right city for that. But having a mentor who is able to show us all the curators and the um, kind of DIY institutions that are like fully supporting this practice and the artists involved and what the community is like, like it was really comforting because I don't know sometimes you think that sound art is hard to really make a living off of in some ways but then you see all of the opportunities and how people make it work and it, that it, that was amazing. Yes.
So unfortunately, I think we have to end. It's after 11 o'clock. But if you have any questions about the application process, about anything, feel free to email us. It's and the sound art um, email goes to uh, Seth, Brad, and myself. And so feel free to you know to continue the conversation if if you like. And also, there's going to be the the uh, in studio uh, tour that Seth is going to be giving. And try to stay if you can from two, and we can see Alana's work uh, two to five. So thank you, um, thank you so much. We look forward to your applications, and thank you for listening.